We're here to talk about change. It is absolutely a truism that everything changes all the time. We live in denial of that. We don't want to get wrinkles. We don't want to get gray hair. We don't want to have modern houses in historic <laughs> districts. But the fact is, things don't stay the same. Um, Marsh and I have very recently, in the past couple of years, been through kind of a whirlwind of change, and we want to kind of give a personal perspective on this with some of the circumstances about our house, which you all know about, but also how that plays into the bigger story of our lives. But first, we want to begin with a very old Chinese story um, in the Zen tradition, which is about a farmer, okay? It's planting time, and this farmer has one mare needs this mare to do the planting. He wakes up the day he's going to start doing this work, and he finds that the mare has sprung the fence and is off doing whatever, no mare for planting season. So as soon as his neighbor hears about this, they come running over, and they say, oh my god, what terrible luck. You are not going to be able to plant this season. You're ruined. And the farmer thinks about it, and he says, well, good luck, bad luck, who knows. So a couple of days later, the mayor comes trotting home with two beautiful stallions in tow. And um, all of a sudden, the neighbors are saying, wow, you are actually the luckiest person alive. You're a rich man now. You have these fantastic horses. The farmer goes, well, good luck, bad luck, who knows. So the farmer has one son, and the son is looking at the stallions and going, I want to ride one of those stallions. So of course he does. He gets on one of the stallions. He gets immediately thrown, breaks his arm and breaks his leg. And those neighbors come running back over going, oh my gosh, now it's really over for you. Your son was the only thing that could help you really get this crop going. Um, you are very, very unlucky. And the farmer thinks about it and says, well, bad luck, good luck, who knows. The very next day, <clears throat> the emperor's Troops come through the town, there's a war on, and they're conscripting the eldest son in every family. But because of his injuries, the son gets left behind to recuperate and ultimately help his father farm. But when the neighbors go, wow, you are lucky, he goes, well, who knows, good luck, bad luck. So we could continue to do this for all of our 30 minutes, but we're not going to. You're probably all breathing a sigh of relief for that. So, but we did just want to start with that because that's kind of a wide angle instructive story about not being able to understand change always when it happens. And so we want to lay out three kind of ideas before we delve into our personal story that we really believe um, in, in terms of thinking about change and our lives. And the first is that change is constant and inevitable. Nothing about our lives is really stable, okay? We tell ourselves that it is. This is jobs, relationships, where you live, your health, family. Everything is always changing. And so we spend a lot of time and energy trying to reassure ourselves that when things are good, they're gonna stay the way they are. And when things are bad, they're gonna change and get better. Um, but a lot of that is just the kind of fiction that we tell ourselves in order to um, get through our lives without anxiety and fear. The second thing is about how we tend to always, whenever anything happens, it's either good or bad. Okay, I, I got money, that's good. Um, I broke my leg, that's bad. Um, it, we tell ourselves that, our friends and family tell us that, but in fact, that's pointless and, and counterproductive because um, when you label that and you all of a sudden, you're the victim or the hero, neither of those um, positions really helps you adapt to a realistically where you are and move on. You're stuck in that role. And the final concept is that <laughs> learning to accept and to navigate change is one of the most important things that we can all do. And it's not easy. It's super, super hard. But until they invent time machines that allow us to go back and do things differently, which I have talked about, I have talked about time machines plenty in my day. Um, but so far, since they're not here, I'm not going to do that anymore. So, um, so the most important thing is to figure out how to deal with where you are and look forward. So our first story is about a house. And um, in 2012, we started looking for a property. I wanted to build. I've never 
designed a house that I inhabited as an architect, and it felt like time to do that. We do an extensive search and <clears throat> find a property in historic Oakwood. Um, as you may know, uh, in a historic overlay district, there are certain rules. This is a part of the design guidelines for building a new, new construction in a historic district. And I felt pretty confident. You know, I've done this before. I've gotten approval for projects. Uh, I know the system. I know the rules. Um, and yet, certain people warned us. They said, well, you know, Oakwood, it's a passionate neighborhood. They're, they're opinionated. <laughs> not, not everyone may love your house. And particularly, the neighbor across the street from the lot that you've bought is, is meddlesome. And, um, and may be a problem. And, and our response was, well, how, how bad could she be? Those of you laughing know the punchline of this story. <laughs> Pretty bad. OK, so historic preservation, in, by its very nature, is about change. That's exactly what it's about. It's about preserving existing buildings and the character of a historic district and managing the evolution of that district. It is not about freezing it in time. Um, and an absolute fact is that every single house in historic Oakwood was new when it was built. You cannot build an historic house. You cannot build an old house. That is impossible without the time machine, which you don't have. So that's a fact. Um, uh, Victorian yeah. houses, for example, um, when they were being built uh, in the 1890s and beyond, uh, were radically different than their neoclassical predecessors. And then in the 1920s, when people were building bungalows that were a third of the size of Victorian houses um, and did not have all that gingerbread, all that turreting, they were radically different than the Victorian houses that were before them. And so our plan was that our house would just be what every house was um, that was ever built in this neighborhood, which was a home designed and built in its uh, moment that would continue to the, uh, contribute to the very uh, rich architectural fabric of this neighborhood. So this is a long <clears throat> and complicated story, and I'm going to distill it into about three sentences. But, you know, we did our design. We submitted it to the Raleigh Historic Development Commission. There was a public hearing that lasted four and a half to five hours. People spoke in support. People spoke in opposition. They made comments. We you know, did the comments, we got our approval, got our building permit, we're building our house, and then we hear a little voice that says, uh, by the way, one of the neighbors has appealed your approval to the Board of Adjustments, but don't worry, it's, it's okay, it's about procedure, it's not really even about your house per se. Um, so we were told n no problem, it couldn't happen. Well, it did happen. We're at the Board of Adjustments and we're absolutely, I mean, you could have knocked us over with a feather when they, they made feather. that that ruling. It's like all of a sudden our house, which was roughly in this state, is uh, deemed as non-compliant. You know, we don't have our approval. Our approval is taken back and we now have a half-built house and uh, we're told to stop construction. So. This was as dark a time in our lives as we could have ever imagined being in. I mean, we put all of our money into this construction, and now we're also having to pour money into legal representation to defend the city of Raleigh's approval of our home. Um, and we had no idea what the outcome of this was going to be. So this change felt bad. Okay, there's no way around that. We felt terrible, and we really had to struggle to get to a place where we could stop being angry and scared, and me in particular. I mean, I would wake up sometimes in the middle of the night and just, you know, cry and feel overwhelmed, and why, why are we here? You know, why can't, I, I wish this had never happened. You know, the woulda, coulda, shouldas, which it took a long time to get there, but we slowly <coughs> kind of crawled out of this hole of feeling completely despairing and overwhelmed and had to figure out a way to keep going on with our lives because even though it felt like it, this house was not our lives, but it felt like it. So just as we're at the most sort of disorienting and kind of unmoored point, this becomes a tremendous news story. I mean, we're contacted by the local media, all the local stations. I mean, we're being interviewed multiple times a day 
on some days. Uh, on some days, and it was just became this circus. AP picked it up. It was on, you know, the Today Show. The New York Times did a piece. Um, the London Daily Mail, the Dubai News, and we're just like, <laughs> where did this come from? And then I'm actually spending the day with Paul Goldberger, the preeminent architectural critic, Pulitzer Prize winning critic who was at, then writing and is now writing for the Vanity Fair to, and he wrote a, a wonderful piece talking about how this is actually what makes sense for historic neighborhoods. But it was an insane life. I mean, it's hard to imagine. All right, because keep in mind, we're also having to, you know, work and like have yeah, all the try. normal life stuff. Yeah. And then <laughs> right. we would get a message, can you be at the site in 10 minutes? For an interview and we felt okay well i guess we need to do that and then you know i would go running off teaching from that it was just i i, I can barely remember it to be honest with you so the unexpected consequences of all of this were amazing and they almost all had to do with people and we can't talk about all the people so just know if you're out there and you were part of the team help marcia and lewis get through this um <laughs> thank you uh so people came to our aid in all kinds of ways. George Smart from North Carolina Modernist Houses, I mean, he was the first one just to dive in and say, I'm going to help you get through this. This was not your battle. You should not be here. He started this legal defense fund, which at first we were like, really? But it was amazing because he rallied so many people to help us defray this money that was hemorrhaging into uh, our legal defense. And so that was incredible. Um, people from all over the world started writing us letters, sending us emails, sending us books, cartoons, pieces of art. I mean, when this got to the scale of being in Dubai and London and all over the country, um, people really wanted to reach out to us, either who had been in a similar situation, knew about a similar situation, or just felt awful about it. And you know, those kinds of things made a real difference because when we were having those dark days, I mean, and there were many dark days, to get an email from somebody, you know, in Gloucester, Massachusetts, or in San Francisco that was like, we're fighting for you, we're rooting for you, we want to help you. Like that made all the difference in terms of our mental state. And I would say also learning to accept help, that was tough. I mean, that was not comfortable for either of us. Yeah. And we had we just like had to get over that. We needed it so badly. Yeah. So yeah. um Myra Coward from Preservation North Carolina. Preservation North Carolina is the state agency that is um, advocating for historic preservation. He also got out in front of this and was really trying to talk to people about why a house like ours is appropriate. It's what you want um, when you are building, especially on an empty lot. Um, you're not tearing anything down in this case. Um, and he wrote letters to all of our neighbors in Oakwood. He wrote letters to the NNO saying, this is not a modernist house. It's modern, but not modernist. Stop calling it that, which didn't work, but that's okay. <laughs> At least he tried. Our neighbor, Peter Rumsey, who's a, um, a realtor and uh, a wonderful uh, citizen of Oakwood, rallied a bunch of neighbors together to sign a petition that went to city council about how they supported our house. Um, Madonna Phillips, the amazing artist in this audience somewhere, brought together 40 neighbors who did our landscaping with us in one day. So they divided plants from their yard, they moved tons of mulch and dirt, and you know, a lot of these people we didn't even know, and we were just getting to know. And people really came to our aid in ways that were profound and powerful. And so when we have been asked, um, we were first asked to do a fundraising event for Jamie Kirk Hahn Foundation. Um, in May of 2015, we moved into our house in November. Um, we could barely, we moved in at the first opportunity we could to move into our house. So I don't know if you can tell in this picture, there's no countertops, that's paper. Um, <laughs> there's no ventilation over the hood, that's Scott Crawford frying soft shell crabs in our house. Um, there's no cabinets, I mean, but we, we really felt like people had given so much to us that we wanted to give back in any way we can. We've done a Raleigh City Farm fundraiser. We're really interested in doing things to like broker on the notoriety of our house to do good. Um, so just know that out there in particular housing and food related issues which seem so much more important than something like this to us. But the point is, is there were all of these amazing consequences that grew out of this really dark period of time. So this was a battle about change, absolutely. There was irrational fear that modernism was going to destroy a neighborhood. And it was, it was a fear-mongering kind of a situation. And it was extremely difficult 
for us to not be stuck in that. And it was so bad that at some point it's like we, we have to walk away or something. And so we just really learned a, va a valuable lesson that we have to live our lives. I mean, we have to be the people we want to be. We have to come to life with positivity and that's just the way it had to be. So one example of a project interrupted that has now been resumed for us that ties into this idea of change and creativity is just a few months before the house thing started falling apart, um, we had started work on our first ever documentary. We had said, like, let's do something that's really challenging and new and exciting. And, um, <clears throat> gives us a change. Gives us some little change <laughs> in our lives. Because uh, anyhow, so, so we um, have these dear friends, Stephen Burke and Randy Campbell, who live in Hillsboro, North Carolina, and have this unbelievable collection. So we started shooting with a friend of ours, Bill Anderson, who's a professional photographer in Atlanta. And um, then the house thing hit. And you know, when you have something as uh, kind of overwhelming in terms of your time, your psychic energy, your resources, your emotions, it's really hard to keep everything else going that you would normally want to do. So we, at some point, realized we have to kind of put this on a shelf. We're not throwing it away, but it's got to sit there for a little while. And we kept talking about it, and we kept saying, we're not going to let this go. We're going to come back to this. And partly motivated by doing this talk this morning, we were like, we got to get a teaser or something ready so that it's like we're actually doing this thing. So we have a two and a half minute teaser to show you that we edited together last weekend with Kevin Wells, the amazing editor, Kevin Wells. And um, we just wanted to show it to you. So we won't do that. The statement can be reasonably made that my largest quirk is an ongoing, relentless, preoccupation with small structures. Whether or not this is adequately and fairly called a psychosis is for others to judge. I just know I dream about buildings. Put in chronological order, we have the entire history of American architecture rendered small. They are in the main houses, because houses are, of course, the main building of our society and, and the main building of our interest. We also have churches in greater number than is seen in most communities. There are townhouses and apartment buildings, schools and a New England meeting house, skyscrapers and other towers. There's an ice rink and a bowling alley. Who knows what I've forgotten? There's so much more. As time has passed, in the way that happens with two people, we have reached both accommodation and assemblage. It's surprising to see how other people respond to it, because living here, you don't always think about the presence of these things. You go about your daily life. This is just what the space you live in has in it. I love plants, trees, whatever. and. That takes a certain amount of appreciation over time, too. This house changes. Things have changed a lot over the years. And I think it resonates with something else I love, too. One object is a thing and a presence. Two objects become a collection. From two to a thousand, or in our case, 1,200, is really only a matter of numerical degree. The point is, having set off on a course of gaining and positioning and learning and sharing, it's hard to stop. So Stephen and Randy have um, incredible patience, needless to say, because we really had to defer something that had all of this momentum. But it was so important that we kept for us, for our sanity, for our sense of who we want to be as people and what we want to do in the world, not only to challenge ourselves even when we have the mental space to do it, but to challenge ourselves even when we have all these other things going on and just to kind of stay the course and know that we would get there. Speaking of which, this is a passion project, a labor of love. This is us and people who are helping us. 
We need a website. We need steady cam work. <laughs> we need some post production if anybody wants to be involved. I mean, we are moving forward with this, and we hope to have it done, um, you know, sometime in the next six to eight months. So, you know, drop us a line. You know where to find us. Yeah. <clears throat> but now back to traumas. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, I've practiced architecture in in Raleigh for quite a number of years and built with my partners, the firm Cherry Huffman. We've uh, designed in that practice many projects around Raleigh, both mostly community focused projects and um, somewhere around 2009 we started talking about maybe trying to get bigger and we ended up merging with a firm, a much larger firm from the Midwest to be more competitive in our market and you know, to sort of, again, compress a very complicated story. It didn't work out too well. My vision of sort of design culture, design values was different. Um, and, you know, fast forward a little bit, and one day the four other partners come in, hand me a letter that says, you're fired, and you have 30 minutes to clean out your office in my, my firm, my building. And so all of a sudden, boom, like that, I you know, have to rethink my life. And it, it was traumatic as hell, I can tell you that. And, um, but I thought, well, okay, you know, what am I gonna do? And one of the first things that really kind of clicked with me was that I came to architecture as an artist. My undergraduate degree is in fine arts and I identify first and foremost as an artist. And I had maybe lost that connection a little bit, so I started working feverishly, as you can see. <laughs> but but, um, but that, that, that really helped me as a starting point. And then um, I, I formed a, a practice. I said, okay, I'm not gonna go to work with a, a large firm, I'm form a practice, it was just me. And, uh, uh, but it was liberating, and it was just like amazing, and so, the concrete result of what seemed like one of the worst things that can happen to you. The concrete result was that I got to teach in Prague for a whole summer with Marcia at the uh, NC State's Prague Institute. Uh, I'm Which now. Which was, by the way, at the height when we were frozen on construction. Um, that's when we got to have this opportunity to teach yeah. in Prague. So there was nothing we could do on our house except for go crazy thinking about why we couldn't build our house. So getting to leave the country was the biggest yeah. gift in the world. And Lewis yeah. could not have done that, you know, working for the other firm. Um, I've recently been selected to be design architect for a library in Annapolis, Maryland. And as a small sort of boutique firm, I can do that, you know. and. And that would not, neither of those would have happened in that previous structure. I have amazing clients and, and amazing work, all of which is very personal and it's, it's just a much, much better situation for me. And I want to particularly thank Ashley Christensen, whom I was working with when this happened, and she said, hell no, I'm going to work with Lewis and help me you know, make that segue, and that's ultimately led to have a really thriving restaurant design practice. And so, um, you know, it's, it's, I'm grateful for what happened. And let me, let me be clear, though, when this happened, I mean, keep in mind, Lewis forgot to mention the date. This was 2012. Yeah. House is 2013. So this is called the one-two punch, right? <laughs> so um, what impressed me as an observer and what I feel like I learned from watching Lewis through this is that he did not spend that much time, you know, in the poor me mode. I mean, as a matter of fact, he never went to victim, um, which is what a lot of people do, right? Oh, something terrible happened to me. This is where I'm going to live for one year, two years, five years, or whatever. He almost immediately went to, well, I need to learn how to do SketchUp and Revit. I've been watching people do it the past few years. I'm going to sit at my dining room table and curse at my computer for the next <laughs> few months. Um, so, so that was very instructive for me to see, like, Lewis decided that his spirit and his, you know, creativity was not going to be crushed by something um, that seemed like it was going to be bad. So, um, one of the other benefits of having your own practice um, is that you have your own time. Your time is your own, right? So you get to decide how you're going to spend it. So. We are really committed to doing creative, challenging things, and so we recently, in February, some of you might have come by, I think a couple of you performed for us, did a show at Flanders Gallery. Um, 
uh, thanks to the generosity of Kelly McChesney, who helped us through this process in collaboration with three NCSE librarians, Jason um, evans Growth, Josephine McRoby, and Trevor Thornton. And um, this was a great opportunity for us, again, to kind of collaborate with our various skills and expertise. I'm a film historian, and so um, uh, we uh, decided to take on this idea of the first filmed kiss, which happened in the 1890s that Thomas Edison filmed. You'll see it up on the screen in a minute. And we invited people to come into a booth that Lewis constructed and perform a kiss for the same 19 seconds that May Irwin and John Rice did in the 1890s. That's the original one. It's tawdry. You might want to turn from the screen. <laughs> And we really wanted to think about the idea, interestingly enough, of change. What has changed since the 1890s? What's permissible in terms of relationships with uh, Lewis's mom and sister, by the way? So um, we had mothers and daughters and friends, and we had people kissing for the first time, and all kinds of interesting things. And it was really, it was a performance piece. It was multimedia. It felt like a big adventure. Um, we had no idea how it was going to turn out when we started. But um, the whole point was that you know, that, that we were able to kind of create this thing. And one of our kind of operating principles as a couple is like when you have an idea, you gotta share it, even if it's kind of crazy. And I remember when we first started talking about this, I was like, I've got this idea, it's kind of weird, but what do you think of it? And Lewis is like, I think that's cool. And then, you know, all you have to do is say something out loud to someone who shares your creative drive and energy and it starts this process. So surround yourself with people who want to encourage you to do these things because I think it's what makes life you know, really interesting. So change is really hard and really exciting. Um, you know, we, we tend, we can sort of live in the denial mode and just be nostalgic for the way things were and gee, wouldn't it be nice if they they could always be that way and, 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 and maybe, they, maybe they can stay that way. Or you also can sort of live in regret and just sort of think about all the mistakes you've made, all the things you would do differently, the woulda, coulda, shoulda. The woulda, coulda, shoulda. Uh, and, uh, or you can look realistically without those labels and judgments at where you are, who you are, and see your life and the world, and this applies even at a global level, see things more clearly and really create a life rich with possibilities. And a kind of postscript to this, um, which is to me ending on a high uh, note, which is we lost a dear friend of ours this month, Marianne Shear, who was 94. And um, I want to bring her up because I can honestly say that I learned more from my relationship with Mary Ann than almost anyone. Um, this is an image of Mary Ann on the upper left from 1966. She was my age exactly in that photograph. So Mary Ann was 50 years older than me. And I don't know about you, but I, she's my only friend I've ever had who was 50 years older than me. And I wanted to hang out with her every chance that I could because she was such an unbelievable person. She was a jeweler and a metalsmith. I'm wearing my Mary Ann today. You can see her in some of hers. Um, and she is someone who just spent her whole life evolving, creating, open to change, um, open to the world, full of joy. And this image from April 2014, I mean, it's hard for me to believe, that was less than two years ago. She's 92. That's the first cocktail we ever had at Euclid <laughs> Street at our house when it was still under construction, when we were in this kind of pause period. Um, not the last cocktail, by the way, but what it was the first. Um, this is a celebration for Marianne. You also see Lou Johansson and Sean Brewster there at the Mahler Gallery. And, this is us visiting with Marianne, one of the last times we got to see her in February, um, just last month. Again, hard to believe, but what was amazing and transformative about knowing Marianne and especially about getting to spend a little time with her in the last weeks of her life is that to the end, I mean, when we had this get together with her at her place in February, she said, you know, I just want to feel good enough that I can get back in the studio and make some more work. I just want to feel good enough that I can start my class at the Craft Center at NCSU. I know I can't finish it, but I want to start it. And so she was always looking forward. She was not kind of wallowing in her situation. This is a terminal diagnosis. She knew she was not getting better. But that sense of joy and curiosity, God, it is so important. And I, I just found it very moving to it know was, her It was so stage. inspiring to be around someone who was facing the biggest change we'll all face and, and 
with such a positive spirit, and it was, it was just a really inspirational uh, to see her. So as we say in the movies, the end. Thank you very much.